I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Michael Rothman, and I am a board-certified internist. I'm also board-certified in emergency medicine, and um, I work at Ocean Medical Center in Brick, New Jersey. I recently um, resigned from being on staff at Rahway Hospital because of a, a contractual issue. And I have my own clinic in East Brunswick. It's called MD Wellness and Spa. And there I take care of people basically using nutrition. So tonight's talk is called The Power of Nutrition, How the Foods You're Eating Are Making You Sick. And you're going to be shocked by some of the things I say tonight. I hope so, at least. So one of the things I really want to impress upon you folks is it's, you would not believe how powerful nutrition is, how important it is to your health. It is so understated. You know, you go to your doctor, you have all sorts of aches and pains or complaints or your blood pressure is high, your cholesterol is high, or whatever it may be, and the doctor is very quick to write a prescription for a drug. But how often does the doctor give you dietary advice? And a lot of times they say, oh, well, the reason you're high, your blood pressure is too high is because you're too fat. Watch what you eat. Or be careful what you eat. You probably all heard this stuff. Okay? How useful is this? It's not. I can also tell you that the, the diet information out there in the mainstream, meaning radio, TV, newspapers, talking heads, most people that you come across, this information is worse than nothing. It's actually misinformation. It's almost designed to cause disease. It's amazing. And I, again, I'm told you, some of the things I'm going to tell you tonight is shocking. Let me just tell you, everything I'm going to tell you tonight is scientific fact. I'm not making things up. There may be some parts of my talk where I'm going to give you my opinion. <laughs> When, when I do so, I will say, listen, this is just my opinion. Okay? It is my opinion that there's, there's something wrong okay, with, the, with the dietary advice being given in the mainstream. It's really it's terrible, and it's causing a lot of problems. So let me go with the handout here because I want to be on the same page as you. First off, I want to impress upon you how important this is, the nutrition. There was a book that came out. It was published in 1919 called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. It was written by Weston Price, who is a dentist. Dr. Price traveled around the world, and he studied so-called primitive cultures. These people, back in the early 1900s, had never, ever seen Western society, some of them. They had never eaten white bread. They had never eaten sugar. They had never had any processed foods whatsoever. And what Dr. Price found was that these people had absolutely no dental problems whatsoever. They had no crooked teeth. They had no cavities. They had no tooth decay. They had nothing at all. It was perfectly normal, healthy teeth. And yet these people didn't brush their teeth. They didn't floss. They didn't see a dentist. All they did was they ate real food, unprocessed. Now, the, the phenomenon that he found, however, was that as soon as they became exposed to Western food, and we're talking just to some, some white flour, sugar, etc., all of a sudden, things changed rapidly. And he saw within people, some people living in this little village over here had no exposure, and then a village over here did, were exposed to Western food. And then over a generation or so, he could see actually a change in the shape of their skulls. And this is what the, the first picture here is supposed to represent. If you look on the left skull, the skull is relatively wide. The face is wide. And there's enough space in there in the jaw to accommodate all the teeth. You can see from the illustrations that what happened is that the, the, the entire face starts to change as soon as you your parents start to eat these foods and then they have their kids, the face becomes narrow. Now apparently my parents ate Western food because I have a narrow face. I needed braces. Now you go to the orthodontist, they go, oh, well, it runs in your family. 
of course, right? That's what causes this, the need for braces. Well, it didn't run in my family probably hundreds of years ago. Now it runs in almost everybody's family. So not only is there teeth problems, but also because the face gets narrow, there's sinus problems as well. So a lot of people that are walking around with crooked teeth and narrow faces and problems with their sinuses, it's, it blame your parents or your grandparents. Don't blame them, but, but it does run in your family. Okay? And if you see people that have nice wide jaws, they tend to also have nice wide healthy bodies and tend to be less sick than people that have narrow jaws and faces. So you don't really hear much about this. What Price noticed was that if you had an older sister and then you had the middle sister and a younger brother that throughout just that one generation that you could actually see a degradation, physical degeneration from one person to the next. So the oldest sister, her mother was much healthier. She's strong and robust and she has wide shoulders and wide face and perfectly straight teeth. And then the middle sister, she's less healthy, less vibrant, less wide face. And the younger brother is a scrawny little kid. So by the time the younger brother, who maybe is 10 years younger than the older sister, was born, his mother's nutritional status had degenerated to the point where he's starting to manifest symptoms. This next slide, you see with the three different feet, if you turn the page, it illustrates an older sister, middle brother, and a younger brother, and they actually de are developing club feet from one sibling to the next. So the oldest sister, maybe she's, I don't know, 16 or something. She has normal feet. And the brother who maybe he's 12 or something, he's got flat feet. And the poor younger brother who looks like he's about eight, he has club feet. Now think about how powerful this is that, that just eating a little white bread and a little sugar and some of these other processed foods actually changes the entire shape of your body for generations to come. This is incredibly powerful. That's what I want to start my talk with with how powerful this is, the power of nutrition. The foods you're, you are eating, I guarantee you, every single person in this room is eating stuff that's poisonous. Now, I know better. I'm still eating stuff that's, that's poisonous because it's so hard not to eat things that are poisonous. I'll give you a little story later about my escapades at the Chinese restaurant last night. <laughs> so let's move on to I want to talk about the autonomic nervous system. Anybody here familiar with the autonomic nervous system? You guys familiar with it? Anybody in here? Nope. No? There are lots of functions that we have, things that we can do that are voluntary. I can talk. I sure can. I can move my hands. I can blink my eyes. I can jump up and down. That's a voluntary movement. But can I stand here and make my pupils get bigger or smaller? Can I start or stop my digestive processes? Can I raise or lower my body temperature? Can I cause my digestion to start moving or to stop? Can I expand my bronchioles or constrict them? No. Now, there may be some people that are specially trained, people that do yoga or high, high forms of meditation that can actually change their, their body temperature and, and pulse rate and these other things. But most people that aren't trained, this happens autonomically. And we have in our, system, in our bodies, it's almost like a thermostat. We have a, a, a way where the body's trying to maintain what's called homeostasis. It's trying to maintain balance. We're in this hostile environment where things are coming at us, whether it's hot or cold or, or grizzly bears or rain or sleet or whatever it may be, and we're trying to maintain balance so that we can function properly. And that's the function, that's the reason why we have this autonomic nervous system. And there's two sides to the system. There's something called the sympathetic branch, and then there's the parasympathetic branch. I want to talk about something called the fight or flight response. Most people have heard that phrase before, right? Fight or flight? Nope. No, you never heard that? Nope. Anybody here? Raise your hand if you've heard of the fight or flight response. Whew. Yeah. What does that mean? Anybody? It's, isn't that when you have anxiety? When you, you have anxiety. Okay. Anybody else? That's right, to a certain degree. 
<laughs> if we're genetically coded that if something comes into our environment and we perceive it as being a danger, we're going to, we're, our whole body gets ready to either flee or to fight. And so sometimes, unfortunately, the things that we perceive as dangerous really are. Wow, that's fantastic explanation. Thank you. That's great. Yes, our environment stands, stimulate us, and we need to be ready to either fight or flight, run away. This is, it's been programmed into us genetically through evolution, if you believe in that, that we need to survive that moment of terror. So what happens when you activate the fight or flight response? What kind of things happen? Your heart rate goes up. What else happens? Blood pressure. Blood pressure does what? Goes up. Goes up. Okay, anything else? Adrenaline is put out by your adrenal medulla, part of your adrenal gland. Very good. What else? What happens to your blood sugar? Goes up. Why is that? Gives you energy, right? Why do you get adrenaline? Gives you energy. What else happens? Headache. Not necessarily. Your pupils actually enlarge. Why would that happen? So you can see better. We'll see so you can see better in case it's dark during this, let's say it's a grizzly bear attack. What else? What happens to your digestion? <laughs> you stop digesting your food. What happens to your bowel activity? Sometimes it, it stops. You stop moving your bowel. Your bowels actually stop moving. How about, so now why would this be? Well, think about it. You're running from a grizzly bear. You're seeing in the dark. Your blood sugar's up. You're sweating, your body temperature rises, your blood pressure rises, your blood sugar rises, and your digestion stops. Why? Because you don't want to be pooping in your pants when you're running away from a grizzly bear. <laughs> right? Your, your bladder sphincter contracts. The sphincter. Because you don't want to be peeing in your pants when you're running from a grizzly bear. Think about how neat this is, how interesting this is. I didn't really learn it this way in med school. I just learned, oh, there's a system and you memorize all these things, but it was never really explained to me how, how really cool this is. So that's the sympathetic branch. That's the fight or flight response. Well, there's another branch which does the exact opposite of the fight or flight response. It's called the parasympathetic branch. And everything's the opposite. Pupils constrict. Blood pressure drops. Pulse rate drops. Temperature drops. Blood sugar drops. Your airways constrict. I didn't, um, your nose increases the mucus in your nose, in your, in your bowels. Your eyes will water. Uh, your bowels actually increase activity. Your sphincter relaxes. So this is the, one is the gas pedal and one is like the brake. Now why is this important? Well because a lot, because this is the thermostat, this is trying to control the homeostasis, right? All this information is coming in from your environment and your body's responding to it. Sometimes appropriately, sometimes inappropriately. Well, let me give you a little story about a, a, a patient. This is somewhat of a real patient that I, I've seen. I've seen many patients like this. Imagine a patient comes into my office and they, they say, Doc, I, my nose is always running. I'm always clearing my throat. I'm always going to the bathroom. I go all the time. I have to move my bowels. It's very urgent. I have to urinate all the time. The patient also has asthma. So I examine this patient. Their hands are really hot. Their ears are hot. Their pupils are tiny. Their pulse is really slow. Their blood pressure is low. Now, they could have gone to several different doctors, and one doctor says, well, you have chronic sinusitis, right? They do, right? Their nose is always running. You have irritable bowel syndrome, because you're constantly going to the bathroom. You have irritable bladder syndrome. You have asthma. You're depressed. You're fatigued. You see, they give you all these different diagnoses, when actually the diagnosis for this patient is your parasympathetic nervous system is overloaded. And I see this all the time. Again, I didn't learn this in medical school, that, that you can actually have these parasympathetic syndromes. And then you can have the opposite effect happen. You can, I, I've seen patients that come in, they're, they're grinding their teeth, their blood pressure is high, they can't sleep, they're constipated, their blood sugar is always high, blah, 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 and it turns out I check them, their hands are freezing, their nose is cold, their eyes are gigantic, their pupils are gigantic. Their blood pressure is very high, their pulse is bounding. Guess what? This patient has a sympathetic overload. Now why am I telling you this? Because a lot of what we call diseases are actually imbalances in the autonomic nervous system. 
Does that make sense? But it's not really, these are not recognized necessarily by mainstream medicine. They, they just say, well, you have this disease or that disease, you have high blood pressure, you have this, you have that. Now, the adrenal gland, is, as uh, this lady in red mentioned before, uh, is connected to your autonomic nervous system. We have two parts of the adrenal gland. One is called the adrenal medulla, which puts out adrenaline, amongst other things that stimulate you. And the other is called the adrenal cortex, which puts out cortisol and other hormones like sex hormones, testosterone, uh, pregnenolone, progesterone, estrogen, puts out all the uh, aldosterone, puts out these hormones. And so the adrenal gland actually is very, very important for maintaining your homeostasis. And it can actually, to a certain degree, save your life. Do I have that slide in here? If you go to the next page, adrenal hormones can save your life. Now, I work in the emergency department. Someone comes in and they're having an allergic reaction. What kind of drugs do we give them in the emergency department when they're having an allergic reaction? Does anybody know? Steroids. Steroids. What else? Epinephrine. 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 Guess what? We give them stuff that comes out of your adrenal medulla, and we give them stuff that comes out of your adrenal cortex. And that saves their life. Well, think about it. You have these little lifesavers right in your body. They're called your adrenal glands. We have them there. It's pretty cool. Think about that. You have your own little pharma you have your own little pharmacy there in your body. And you're constantly releasing adrenaline or cortisone or cortisol when you have these little emergencies that come up. Now, if the system is overwhelmed, you can have an anaphylactic reaction or some severe allergic reaction, and you're going to need some intervention. But if your body's strong enough, you have all these insults to your body all the time. And if your adrenal glands and your autonomic nervous system is balanced and functioning, and has enough reserve, then you don't need to go to the emergency room. In fact, you may not even have any symptoms at all because your body's constantly taking care of these things to maintain homeostasis. What happens when your adrenal glands become weak? Has anybody here ever heard the term adrenal fatigue? Right, this is, if you go to the doctor, they'll tell you, oh, this doesn't really exist. Well, only if it gets really bad, they call it Addison syndrome. Or you may, may have heard of adrenal overload, and again, it, this is something that most mainstream doctors don't recognize. This. They say, well, you have Cushing's. They, if it's really, really, really pathological, they'll give it a name and say, yeah, it's real. But you don't go from normal to pathological without somewhere in between, right? It's not like flipping a switch. So there's a lot of people that they don't have pathology, but they have dysfunction. What do I mean by that? Well. Imagine you go to your doctor and you're feeling really tired all the time. And he runs all the blood tests. Oh, I did the EKG, I checked your thyroid, I did this, I did that. You're not anemic, you're not this, you're not, you're fine. You're not fine. Your blood tests may be fine, but you're not fine. Because if you were fine, you wouldn't have gone to the doctor in the first place. How many people have had that experience? Okay. So what, you, what you're experiencing then is not a disease, you're, dis, you're experiencing dysfunction. And that's really where my practice is geared. I treat dysfunction, functional problems. And, and almost everybody experiences some of these, and a lot of it has to do with your diet. So let's go to the next page. Wellness equals balance, disease is imbalance. Now I learned in medical school that the definition, we have any doctors in here tonight? You're a doctor, sir? No, I'm a researcher. Researcher, okay, I met you another time, right? Okay, so I don't want to insult anybody who's in the medical profession. <laughs> Any nurses in here tonight? So I learned in medical school that basically if you didn't have a disease, that means that you were well. So you go to the doctor, we've ruled out you don't have cancer, you don't have high blood pressure, you don't have diabetes, you don't have asthma, you don't have arthritis, you don't have this, you don't have that, therefore you're well. But yet, there's a lot of people out there that don't have any of the diseases, and they're not well. They feel lousy. They have aches and pains. They, they are fatigued all the time. So then they come up with new things to describe this. Well, you have chronic fatigue syndrome, or you have fibromyalgia, or you have this, you have that. I would like to propose that the definition of wellness or health is not 
lack of disease, but it's actually balance. If you have balance, you're going to have a good chance of feeling healthy. If you have imbalance, you will manifest symptoms eventually. So I want to go through a little game that I like to play. I call it naming and blaming. It's like a game show. OK, so now you go to your doctor and say, doctor, why do my hands hurt all the time? Why do all my joints hurt? And the doctor says, oh, well, you have arthritis. Doctor, why does my head hurt all the time? Oh, well, you have migraines. Doctor, why is it that I'm running to the bathroom all the time, I have stomach aches, sometimes I have diarrhea, sometimes I have constipation? Oh, well, you have irritable bowel syndrome. Doctor, why can't I sleep at night? Oh, well, you have insomnia. Think about it. This is what you're told, right? In some ways, it's a little bit retarded. Now you ask your doctor why. Why do I have insomnia? Why do I have head migraine headaches? Why do I have arthritis? Why do you know, I have this irritable bowel syndrome? The x-ray may show you have arthritis, but, but if you ask your doctor, why do I have these things? What do they tell you? Age. You're getting old. There's, oh, there's the six excuses. You're getting old. What else? OK, you're not eating properly. In other words, you're too fat. <laughs> what else? You're not huh? Not you're not moving. OK. What else? It runs in your family. Right? You've heard this one? It's genetic. You're getting old. It's all in your head. And nobody knows. Those are the six reasons for every single disease. And in some ways, they're right about this. As we get older, things can accumulate and problems get worse and worse. If you have a poor diet, you will get fat. And so the poor diet is contributing to it. Your, what you think, your brain, your thoughts can imbalance your autonomic nervous system and your adrenal glands and cause and contribute to problems. Things do run in families. Things are genetic. And there are things that nobody knows. Let me just. Uh, Show you what you missed here, ladies and gentlemen. I'm sorry. That's the book. That's Dr. Price. This is an older sister. I'm sorry. This is a, someone who's not been at look at her teeth. Crooked teeth, narrow face, narrow sinuses. Look at this boy. Look at this boy. Oh, runs in his family that these crooked teeth. Older sister, wide jaw, wide face, wide shoulder, narrow face, narrow shoulders. Scrawny kid, narrow face, crooked teeth. Same family. Yes, sir. Sorry, could you just read out what that says on the bottom? It says Price Pottinger Nutrition Foundation, www.ppnf.org. They required me to put that on there for copyright reasons. These we saw before. Older sister, middle brother, younger brother, normal feet, flat feet, club feet. You really, it's hard to see on this slide, but his feet are club yeah. here. And this is the thing about the different autonomic nervous system. Dilated pupils versus small pupils. Inhibits slow flow of saliva, blah, 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 blah. I don't want to go over everything. So we were in the middle of this, this discussion about naming and blaming. So you ask your doctor, why? Why do all these happen? And they end up giving you those six reasons as the cause of disease. But what really causes disease? And that's what I want to talk about tonight is what really causes a lot of diseases? Well, it's imbalances cause disease. And one of the biggest imbalances is your diet. It's very, very important to not injure yourself with your diet. Let me go back this one slide or a couple slides here. This slide here is very, very important. Steroid hormone synthesis pathways. C cholesterol is at the very top. Why is cholesterol at the top of a hormone synthesis pathway? Did you know that all your adrenal and sex hormones come from cholesterol? The stuff that they tell you if you eat it will poison your body. Remember I said in the beginning, I'm going to say things that are going to shock you. And that a lot of information out there is actually misinformation. Cholesterol is not poison. It's not. They've been telling us this for 50 years. Saturated fat is not poisonous. I'm going to show you the data. I am not making this up. This is not my opinion. This is a biosynthetic pathway. I got this out of the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. You can open up any biochemistry book and see that your hormones come from cholesterol. 
Now what happens if you're really stressed out all the time? Your body thinks it's under an attack. What happens? You're going to actually start making something called cortisol. And lots of it. More and more and more. And guess what happens to these other hormones? They go down. Because there's only so much stuff that your adrenal glands can make. So your cortisol, which is a stress hormone, goes higher and higher and higher. And these other hormones like estrogen and progesterone and androstenedione and testosterone, DHEA, pregnenolone, these all drop. So consequently, I can't tell you how many patients have come to my office and I run a hormone panel on them and their cortisol level is sky high and all their other hormones are in the gutter. Why? Because their body thinks they're under stress. Why is their body thinking this? What's causing that stress? That's one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. Well, let me just tell you, anytime you eat something that's poisonous, your body thinks you're being attacked by a grizzly bear. Anytime you think a bad thought, your body thinks you're being attacked by a grizzly bear. So your thoughts can actually cause disease. It is all in your head. But what you eat is very, very powerful. And I want, you do have control over that. And so I want you to know the difference between poisonous food and non-poisonous food. And what they are telling you is so much of it is not true. It's amazing. How do you define poisonous? I will do that very shortly, <laughs> sir. <laughs> this is what is known as the U-shaped curve. What does that mean? Well, there's a certain um, normal range for anything. Whether you have, if you have too little water, what happens? It's no good. You're dehydrated, right? Did you know you can have too much water? Did you know this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. In fact, um, some of these hazing things in these fraternities, the kids drink a gallon of water like in five minutes, and some of them actually die. You can go crazy from drinking too much water. It actually dilute down your sodium levels and, and make you go insane. I've seen this in the emergency department. So this is what I call the Goldilocks principle. You want to have the right amount of everything. If you don't have the right of amount of everything, everyone's heard of Goldilocks, right? The soup was either too hot or too cold. The bed was too hard or too soft. And baby bears was always just right, right? See, baby bears. She's eating baby bear stuff. And dad's not very happy at all. <laughs> so you want your soup to be just right. If your soup isn't just right, you will experience symptoms. And it will drain your adrenal glands and activate them and cause you to increase your cortisol levels. So for nutrients, this is common sense now. This is not a, I mean, an optimal amount of nutrients exists. Too much is no good and too little is no good. Can we, can we agree on that? You can't really argue with this. How about for poisons? Is there an optimal amount of a poison? No. There's no optimal amount of poison. Less is always better. Can we, argue, can, we dis, can we agree on this? Can't argue with this. This is common sense. Okay, so let's look at dietary macronutrients. There are only three macronutrients. There's protein, fat, and carbs. Proteins, they're good, right? Fats, what are they, good or bad? They're bad. And carbs are, carbs are good or bad? Mm, there seems to be some disagreement here. So now let's go back to fats. There's good fats and bad fats, right? So what are the good fats? What else? Fish, what else? We said olive oil already. Nuts. nuts. Why are nuts good? They're protein. Rich in protein. What else? Omega oil. They have omega threes. Yeah, I just gave a talk last week called "Good Fats, Bad Fats." There's something fishy going on around here. Okay. The only reason why these nuts are good is because they're low in saturated fat and cholesterol. That makes them good. Think about all the fats that you hear that are good. They're only good because they don't have saturated fat, because saturated fat's evil, right? It clogs your arteries and causes every disease. Let's look at what the government says about this. This is a food label. It says total fat, keep it less than 65 grams if you're having 2,000 calories a day. So therefore, fat is obviously a poison, right? Less is always better. Are fats poisonous? According to the government, they are. Right? Less is better. Says it right here. Keep it less than 65. If you go down to zero, no problem. Have zero fat in your diet. Saturated fat, keep it less than 20 grams. Well, that must be even more poisonous than regular fat. Right? 
because less is better. <laughs> Cholesterol is even more poisonous. Keep it less than 300 milligrams. That's 0.3 grams. That must really, really, really be poisonous. Oh my God, don't touch this stuff. You will instantly clog your arteries. Well, let's just skip sodium for now. Look at carbohydrates. 300 grams a day on a 2,000 calorie. Well, that must be what we should be eating. Carbohydrates, right? It's good for you, right? Eat complex carbs. Make sure 75% of your diet comes from carbs. Keep your fat low. Eat low fat. How many times have you heard this, to eat low fat? From your, you want to lose weight? Eat low fat. Lower your blood pressure? Eat low fat. Lower your cholesterol? Eat low fat. Or make sure you have omega-3s. How, how many grams of carbohydrates in a slice of bread? About 16. So 300 grams of carbs is about 19 slices of bread. The government on a 2,000 calorie a day diet is telling you to eat 19 slices of bread a day. You think this would be good for you? I'm not making this up. This is what the government is telling you. Why are they telling you this? What is the purpose of this? To sell bread, exactly, to sell grains. On a, on a 2,500 calorie a day diet, 375 grams of carbs, a minimum, yet keep the fat down. So fat's poisonous, according to the government, and carbohydrates are really, really good for us. Yes, sir? I got a question. Um, they have a, a pyramid. Oh, well, you're showing it now. <laughs> oh. They that certainly do. It, it releases a pyramid, and I don't know if the right thing's at the top. Well, now, who made this pyramid? The government. Which, which part of the government? The U.S. Department of Agriculture. I'll say it again, the U.S. Department of Agriculture. What is the mission of the U.S. Department of Agriculture? To make sure the agricultural companies are successful. So they want you to eat lots of this. Why, is, why do they want you to eat this stuff? It's cheap for them to make. They sell it for a big, this is where they make their profit. They can stick this stuff on a shelf and it will last weeks or months or even years. This stuff is perishable and relatively expensive. So their profit almost completely comes from carbohydrates. And therefore, they want us to eat carbohydrates. Now, I know that sounds a little, little cynical, but I'm not making this up. This is right here. Now, they're telling you, think about what they're saying to eat. Six to 11 servings of bread, cereal, rice, and pasta a day. Now, if a serving of bread is two slices, they're telling you to eat somewhere between 12 and 22 slices of bread a day, right? That's what they're telling us. Plus two to four servings of fruit, plus three to five servings of vegetables, plus two to three servings of meat, poultry, fish, dry beans, eggs, nuts group, plus three, two to three servings of milk, yogurt, and cheese, and fats and oils, these are poisonous. Use them sparingly. How many people in this room eat this much food every day? You know why nobody in this room eats this much? Because you would not fit through that, that door back there if you ate this much. It's insane. You want to hear something even more insane? If you go to the doctor, all the health information, the food and nutrition information, comes from the food pyramid. All the talking heads, all the TV stations, all the radio stations, everybody who's an expert on nutrition, not everybody, but Mainstream dietitians, nutritionists, all base their recommendations on the food pyramid. How crazy is this? If you start with a lie, everything else is a lie. Well, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? Almost everything you've heard up to this moment in your life about nutrition has pretty much been a lie. Unless you've heard some non-mainstream person out there, okay? What I'm telling you is considered alternative nutrition. Why is it all turned? Because it's not the mainstream commercial, let's sell food nutrition out there. And if you, if you have this point of view, you are considered out of the mainstream, alternative, and maybe even a quack. Okay, so I told you I'm gonna tell you some stuff. I'm gonna tell you some stuff, it's really gonna upset you. You may say, Doc, you're confusing me. No, you've been confused up to this point. I'm clarifying things, okay? Saturated fats, won't they hurt me? This is not true. The notion that saturated fat was bad created by the food industry to sell margarine, vegetable, and seed oils. The whole point of them doing this was to sell margarine and to, put, and to replace butter with, with vegetable oils. They, they created this notion that saturated fat is bad. And let me dispel this right now with one study 
Now this is not just one study. This was a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition in January of 2010. Meta-analysis of prospective cohort studies evaluating the association of saturated fat with cardiovascular risk. Came out of Harvard Medical School. It's a pretty good institution, right? How many people heard this on the radio? How many people heard this on TV? How many people heard this on the newspaper? Raise your hand. Nobody. It was not reported. Now I know this, again, this sounds a little conspiratorial. Did I make this up? No, it's right here. This was based on every study that was ever done on saturated fat. Well, every study ever done on saturated fat shows that it does not harm you. Yet how come the American Heart Association is telling you not to eat saturated fat? And the American Diabetes Association, the American Medical Association, why are they making these telling you? Well, because they're going right from the food pyramid. But the food pyramid is there to sell food. Doctor, isn't that a little stupid? This is one of the reasons why we have epidemics in almost every single disease. Name a disease, arthritis, diabetes, high blood pressure, cancer, epilepsy, autism, name a disease. Every single disease is epidemic at the same time. How is that possible? Oh, it's genetic. It runs in your family. You're just getting old. You're too fat. It's all in your head. Nobody knows. Let me tell you, if it was really genetic, the human race would have died off thousands upon thousands of years ago. Well, we're heading towards extinction right now. You can see it. Look around. We are heading towards extinction, one way or another. And the food is actually killing. How many people have trouble getting pregnant now? Now, I remember when I was a kid, everybody was trying not to get pregnant. Birth control was the big thing. You use condoms. You birth. Everybody was trying not to get pregnant. Now, fertility clinics are popping up everywhere. No one can get pregnant anymore on their own, or very few people, because they're so sick and their genes are so screwed up, and their bodies are so screwed up, their body chemistry is so, so screwed up. Why? We are slowly poisoning ourselves. You need to have the right balance of things. If you eat too many carbohydrates, this is the following what happens. This is what the government wants, I suppose. It lowers your basal metabolic rate, which will make you fat. It'll increase estrogen levels, which causes breast cancer and other cancers. Prostate problems increases insulin levels, which will lead to diabetes and obesity and thyroid problems, raises your triglycerides, which is fat. It will raise your cholesterol if you eat too many carbs. Leads to fatty liver, low blood sugar, high blood sugar, and causes what's called metabolic syndrome. How many people here have heard of metabolic syndrome? I've heard of it, but I don't know what it is. <clears throat> yeah, it's not something that's highly publicized. Metabolic syndrome is a syndrome of excessive carbohydrates leading to high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, and obesity. It was, the, that term was coined by Dr. Gerald Reavens back in the early 90s. Dr. Reavens was discredited. They said he was a quack because he was saying that eating carbohydrates was bad for you. He must be a quack. Dr. Atkins said that you should not eat carbohydrates. He was a quack. How did Dr. Atkins die? Nobody shot him. He hit his head. What else did, have you heard? He had a heart attack. Thank you. And he was fat, right? He was obese. You heard this? Okay, this is how the news reported his death. Now, he did. The truth is, Dr. Atkins, I just want to give an example of the news. Dr. Atkins slipped on the ice and hit his head. At that time, he weighed somewhere around 180 pounds. He wasn't the skinniest guy, but he was not obese. And as far as I know, he did not have any heart disease. So he hit his head, and he was bleeding internally in his brain. And they started giving him steroids and pumping him with fluids, which is what the standard medical care is for a head injury. And over the last two weeks of his life, he gained like 25, 30 pounds. Was it fat? No, it was fluid from all the fluids and all the steroids they gave him. And eventually his heart stopped. Did he have a heart attack? No, it was from all the fluids and all the drugs they gave him. And the news reported to a lot of people that Dr. Atkins died of a heart attack and he was obese. Therefore, he w it proves that his theory was wrong. Now, do you see how they do this? Now, I, I know I, I'm sounding like a conspiratorial nut, but this is the truth. The guy did not die of a heart attack. He hit his head. Yet, the, if you go out on the street and ask a thousand people, a lot of people think he died of a heart attack and that he was obese and therefore he was a quack. No. What you hear on the news 
is all, almost all advertising, whether it's health news or political news or news about a new product. They're selling you something. Now, what am I selling you? I'm not selling you anything, actually. I don't, I'm not selling you any products. What I want to actually sell you on is that I know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm, I'm educated. I'm informed. I don't take anybody's word for anything. I'm very skeptical about things. And that if you're looking for solutions to your healthcare problems, you can look towards me and I can, I can offer solutions that other doctors are absolutely clueless on. And the reason is because our medical school training taught us how to identify and treat symptoms and identify and treat diseases. This is exactly what I don't do. I don't treat any diseases. I don't treat any symptoms. I actually find out what's causing your problem. Isn't that unique? So somebody asked before, what are, metab what are toxins? What are metabolic poisons? Well, for metabolic poisons, less is always better. And let's go through some of these. Sugars. Sugar is a metabolic poison. It's very addictive. The more that you eat, the more you want. And the more you eat sugar, it actually consumes vitamins and minerals in, it, in the process of, of digesting and using that sugar. Now, the worst sugar you can put in your body is called what? Fructose. Fructose is bad? Where does fructose come from? Corn syrup? Where else? Fruit. Wait a minute. I thought fruit was good. Is fruit good or not? Not too much of it. In moderation. Everything in moderation. You were always told it's good. Eat your fruits and vegetables, right? They're the same thing, fruits and vegetables? No. But how, come, how many times have you heard someone, eat your fruits and vegetables, eat your fruits and vegetables, eat, they always put them together, like they're the same thing. Take a four-year-old kid and stick a bunch of fruit and a bunch of vegetables in front of him. What's he going to eat? Fruit. Why? It's sweet. It's, sweet. it's full of sugar. Fruit is not good for you, necessarily. Does it have things in there that are good for you? Yeah. There's some vitamin C in there, and there's phytonutrients in there. You can get these in other places without all the sugar. And I tell my patients, if you are overweight, if you're, if you're diabetic, if you have high blood pressure, don't eat fruit. And you know what they tell me? But doctor, I love fruit. And it's natural. It's got to be good for me. I have more arguments about this than anything else. Now, why is fruit not so good? This is a biochemical pathway. Again, I'm not making these things up. This is a fact. You can open up any bio, a biochemistry book. This pathway happens to come from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition. It shows that fructose goes down this metabolic pathway and turns into something called triglycerides, which is the same thing as fat. You cannot use it for energy. Here, glucose, which comes from sucrose, which is table sugar, it can at least turn into energy. It can also be stored as fat. But you cannot use fructose as energy directly. It has to be turned into fat first, and then the fat has to be burned. It's a double step, and it takes a long time Fruit will make you fat. If you want to gain weight, eat lots of fruit. Why do Weight Watchers make you eat fruit? And weight Watchers is based on the food pyramid. Oh, but they also tell you they, that, that they, you know, they don't tell you to eat a lot of fruit. Okay. But most of the weight loss programs out there are based on the low-fat paradigm that eating low-fat is good. Yes, ma'am. I have been eating tons and tons and tons of fruit every day since I've been Here we go, the fruit argument. Here we go. I'm not going to give it up, but I mean, I eat tons. You know, I okay. Size, sometimes twice a day. Here we go with the fruit. Uh, but so, it's so what is your point, hon? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not the same thing for everybody. If you're fat, if you have high blood pressure, if, you have, if you're having diabetes, don't eat fruit. Is fruit bad for everybody? No, you can have fruit, but don't think it's really that good for you. It's not that good for you. And most of the fruit we have is actually hybridized fruit that's actually been designed to be very, very sweet. But isn't, natu isn't fruit natural? Well, yeah. Go out and pick all the fruit you see growing around here and eat as much as you want, I tell my patients. That's natural. Eating cantaloupe 365 days a year is not natural, right? Eating things from all over the world all year round is not natural. When would we normally have fruit here in New Jersey? Summer. What part of the summer? The end of the summer, right? When, that's when all the fruit ripens. What happens after the summer? Fall and winter. What happens, what did, used to happen during fall and winter? 
We used to starve during the winter. Right? Yeah, you didn't have peaches. Yeah. Ma'am, let's go back 300, 500, 1,000, 10,000 years ago. What used to happen? Don't tell me we used to go to the shop right and, and buy canned goods. We, that was those folks. We, meaning human beings. Human beings used to starve to death in the winter unless they were fat. So we would basically get ready to hibernate. We would gorge ourselves with, food, with fruit to make ourselves fat. Now, this is my opinion. This is not necessarily a fact. I believe that fruit was put on this planet to make us fat so that we could survive the winters. You're shaking your head, but that's OK. People are heavy are not eating fruit. They're eating Burger King and. That's not true. You're not, are, you a, are you a medical professional? You see patients in your practice? Yeah, no. OK. I can tell you that I have plenty of patients that are consuming lots and lots of fruit on low-fat diets that are obese. OK, so fructose, it's pre preferentially taken up in your liver. It's poorly utilized by the rest of the body. You cannot burn it directly. It raises your triglycerides. It lowers the good cholesterol. Sugar is very extremely addictive. The more you have, the more you want. But doc, doesn't that, if I crave it, doesn't mean it's good for me? No, it means you're actually addicted to sugar. How many people in here crave sugar? Crave sweet things. You eat dinner. You're not raising your hand, sir, huh? Yeah, he won't raise his hand. OK, why is that? I believe we're addicted to it. Why? So that we can actually gain weight, because that what used to be an advantage. Yes? Um, I'm addicted to sugar. Is there a way to become unaddicted? Yes, to there's a very simple way. Don't eat it. <laughs> you know, if you were an alcoholic, you couldn't just have one drink, right? Because right. one's not enough, or one's too much, and a, a keg is, is not enough. Right? I don't eat any sugar. I don't eat desserts. I don't eat sweets. I don't eat this or that. I'm not addicted. I used to be. I used to be. I used to start my day with a glass of orange juice and a chocolate donut. And I would eat dinner and I would crave cheesecake. I would eat cheesecake every single day. Every day. Just one piece. It was a little piece. And then about five years ago, I decided I'm not going to eat any more sweets. I actually overdosed on cheesecake. A friend of mine made a homemade organic cheesecake. And I decided I'm going to eat this thing before it goes bad. I'm going to have not only a slice before or after dinner, I'm going to have a slice after lunch and a slice after dinner. And not only a slice, I'm going to have a big slice because this is not going bad. Well, around the third day, all of a sudden, I got really, really sick. My stomach was cramping. I was really, really sick. And I thought to myself, my god, did I just actually overdose on cheesecake? And I decided to do an experiment. I'm just not going to eat it. And for the first two weeks, I dreamed of cheesecake. I was craving it. I was going nuts with cheesecake. And then all of a sudden, I forgot about it. I was like, wow, I'm not addicted anymore. This is incredible. And so I went for like six months without any sugar, no cravings whatsoever. I didn't even think about it. Walked through the supermarket, ah, who needs you? And then I went to a wedding, and they served wedding cake. And I had to have the wedding cake. It's good luck for the bride and groom. And I had that piece of wedding cake. And guess what happened? For the next two weeks, I craved sugar every single day. And I said, oh my god, this is incredible. One piece of wedding cake, and I'm craving sugar for two weeks? Now, if you eat it more than once every two weeks or so, you're probably addicted. So it's extremely addictive. and so. Get it out of your system. It's a metabolic poison. Fried foods, polyunsaturated fatty acids is the next sort of thing. These things are so poisonous. These are your vegetable oils. These are the things that the food companies are putting in your food. Why? Because it's cheap. And if you went into a time capsule and went into the supermarket 75 years ago, just about everything was made with coconut oil, butter, or palm oil, very high in saturated fat, very high in cholesterol. And they played, started to play games, and they came out with this misinformation saying, oh, butter and palm oil and coconut oil, these are all bad for us. Don't eat them. Eat vegetable oils instead. They're so much better. So what they did was they substituted these oils that were good for us, that were relatively expensive, with these cheap vegetable oils. Did they lower the prices of the food? No. no. What they did was they increased their profit margins and told us these things were even better. And this is when margarine was born. And if you remember the 60s, the 
how promise margarine and Captain Kirk was standing there telling you to eat promise margarine and, and all this other stuff. And then we heard, oh, whoops, margarine's actually bad. We made a mistake. We're sorry. They knew. So why are these things so bad? Because what happens is it actually stresses your adrenal glands. When you eat vegetable oils or fried foods, your adrenal glands will instantly put out cortisol to counteract the damage, a stress hormone. And your regular hormones, your other hormones, actually drop very quickly. And your body thinks that you're under attack by a grizzly bear. This can lead to loss of minerals. It can lead to something called oxidative stress. It can accelerate aging, breakdown of muscle tissue. It's really poisonous. I don't eat any of that stuff either. What if Why? You cook olive oil? If you cook olive oil at too high a temperature, it actually causes this as well. Let's just talk about oxidative stress for a minute. Anybody know what this is? You've heard of oxidative stress, right? You've heard of antioxidants. You can't go anywhere without hearing about antioxidants these days. And free radicals, right? What are these things? What causes them? Well, we burn stuff to make energy. We burn stuff with oxygen to make energy. And in the process, we create the heat that we put off are called free radicals. And this can damage our tissues. So we use antioxidants to fight. These are like the fire extinguishers. And they neutralize the free radicals. Now I'm going to ask you a question. And the answer is going to surprise you. What is one of the most important, name some important antioxidants in your body. What are some of the most important ones? Vitamin C, right? E. E. What else? Vitamin D. Alpha lipoic acid. Alpha lipoic acid, okay. CoQ10. Vitamin D. Vitamin D is not an antioxidant, no. A. Vitamin K has some antioxidant a. properties. A, not really. It's actually a proxenet. B12. B12. B3. B3. Omega-3. Omega-3 is not an antioxidant. It's actually a prooxidant. It causes oxidative stress. It's very fragile. This is the subject of good fats, bad fats. There's something fishy going on around here. What is the most, one of the most important antioxidants in our body? We have not mentioned it. I will mention it now. It's called cholesterol. Wow. Why do we have cholesterol in our bodies in the first place? Is it there just to clog our arteries? But doc, doesn't cholesterol clog your arteries when you have a heart attack? Yeah. What kind of cholesterol clogs your arteries? It's the oxidized LDL. It's the burnt cholesterol. Why does the cholesterol burn in the first place? because of oxidative stress, fried foods, sugars. These things burn your cholesterol and, and cause it to clog your arteries. The, but eating cholesterol itself actually doesn't do this. This is the big lie. This is, the big, this is not true. They made this up. They did studies on, on rabbits that prove if rabbits eat cholesterol, they will clog their little hearts okay, and arteries. But this does not happen in humans. Let's talk about the omega-3s and omega-6s right now. And I could spend the whole night talking about this, but there's a very, very intricate pathway between omega-6s and omega-3s. This is the simplified version. I believe I gave you this. Mm -hmm. OK. So omega-6s are pro-inflammatory. All these oils cause inflammation. And these oils reduce inflammation. Well, doesn't that mean that the omega-3s are good for you? Yes. I'm going to talk about soy in a few minutes. But yeah, soy is not good. This is one of those metabolic poisons. Let's look at the omega-6s. These are bad oils. Canola oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower. These are all pro-inflammatory. Open up any packaged good, and they all have one of these things. Buy any box of cereal, guaranteed, you'll find canola or soybean or sunflower oil in there. Buy any bread. unless Cheerios got it. Oh, yeah. Supposed to be good for you. Lowers your cholesterol, yeah. <laughs> Endorsed by the American Heart Association. Right. Where does corn oil come from? Corn. Where does soybean oil come from? Soybean. Where does safflower oil come from? Safflower. Here's the punchline. Where does canola oil come from? Canola. <laughs> Who said it? <laughs> Canada. Canada. It comes from Canada. <laughs> Canadian oil. Now, we've been told that canola is really good, right? Yeah. Why is canola good? Because it's low in saturated fat, and it's high in monounsaturated fats. Does that mean it's good for you? No. They're trying to sell you something. 
you are being ripped off by the food companies. Canola oil is not good. It's a brand name. Where, what is the oil in canola oil? Anybody know? No. It's called rape seed oil. It's actually poisonous to human beings. Isn't that better though than rape. vegetable oil? Rape, not grape. It oh. is vegetable oil. It's just as bad if not worse. It's terrible. You are being ripped off. You're being poisoned by the food companies for them. That, yes, sir. But what about the olive oil? Olive oil is, is okay. It's monounsaturated. It's a good oil. It's very balanced. I absolutely endorse the use of olive oil. I wouldn't fry with it because you will burn it and oxidize it. Okay? Sure. Okay, so what's a good oil? I'm going to get to what you should eat real soon, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? <laughs> So now here's the pitch. You've heard this a zillion times. If you drive your car and listen to AM radio, if you've heard on the TV or in the doctors, whatever, the everybody's eating too many, too many omega-6s, right? We've all heard this. Yeah. And omega-6s are very bad, and we need to have a better omega-6, omega-3 balance. So take omega-3s to balance out those omega-6s, right? This is the pitch. Yeah. No argument. If this causes inflammation, these reduce inflammation. Well, if you're eating too many omega-6s, what should you do? Should you take fish oil to counteract it? That's what they're telling you to do. Why? Because they're selling fish oil. Stop eating omega-6 fatty acids. They're poisonous. You can't fix a poison by adding something else. Less is always better when it comes to poisons. If you walk out of here with one thing, don't poison yourself. You're not going to fix your poisoning by taking drugs or other supplements. It doesn't work. This is fool's gold. This is, not, this is nonsense. So omega-6s cause it. Omega-3s reduce it. Too much omega-6s should be rectified by decreasing omega-6s. Just adding omega-3s may temporarily relieve symptoms, but in the long term, you have too many fatty acids. Too much of anything is no good. I gave a whole talk on this the other day, and let me tell you, you, anybody hear the term, this is just more snake oil? You've, had this, you've heard this term. What is snake oil? Oil from a snake. Oil from a snake, right? What is snake oil then? What is it made out of? It comes from snake. It's full of omega-3 fatty acids. Snake oil and fish oil are exactly the same thing. Her mouth is open going, oh my God. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> so when you hear the phrase, this is just more snake oil, substitute, oh, this is just more fish oil. And in fact, if you go back 100 years ago, they recommended snake oil for everything. It's good for your brain, good for your heart, good for your joints, good for this, good for that, it's good for everything. It's exact, exactly the same thing they're saying about uh, fish oil today. So one day, hopefully, in the next 50 years, you'll hear the phrase, ah, that's just more fish oil. Fish oil is just, it's in everything now. It's ridiculous. Let's talk about some other metabolic poisons. Neurotoxic agents, aspartame, saccharin, sucralose, MSG, nitrates, nitrites. These actually will fry your brain cells. They are neurotoxic. They cause excitement in your brain, and your brain thinks that you're actually being attacked by a grizzly bear. Now, I told you I was going to give you a little Chinese food story. So last night, my girlfriend, she had to have Chinese food. So we went to this Chinese restaurant. I'm sitting there going, oh my god, what am I going to eat? Because I'm not going to eat these, this oil that they're going to cook this stuff in because it's actually going to make me sick. So I don't eat any of that stuff. So I, I asked the manager, I said, is there anything on the menu that does not have oil? He says, well, well, we can make a special dish for you. Special chicken with no oil, rice that was uh, steamed, and steamed vegetables. I said, oh, great. He said to me, is there anything else you can't eat? I said, well, you know, I'm okay. As long as it doesn't have oils, I'm okay. Well, I thought I was okay. Well, obviously, he, they put MSG in there. I woke up, and I didn't know this was going to happen, and I didn't know I was going to say this today. At 3 o'clock in the morning, I saw a sudden woke up, and the entire room was spinning around. And then I went back to sleep, and I said, oh, my God. I woke up at 7 o'clock in the morning. There, I was stumbling. I was spinning around. It finally left somewhere around 8 o'clock. Thank God. I just got on the road to go to my office. I can absolutely tell you for, for sure that it was the MSG that did this because I don't, I don't touch that stuff. Think about that. Think about people that have vertigo all the time. 
Well, Chinese food doesn't bother me. I eat it all the time. If you eat poisons all the time, you will have symptoms all the time and not realize okay. that they're causing your problem all the time. How many people are poisoning themselves every day with high fructose corn syrup, these neuroexcitotoxic agents, too much sugar, too many carbs? Probably a lot of people sitting here in this room and probably almost everybody that you know. Let me just tell you something. You're not used to it. That's why you got sick. Your girlfriend didn't get sick. No. You didn't have the same thing. But let me just tell you something. You probably think, this guy must be some sort of food fanatic. What is wrong with him? I'm not a fanatic. Let me tell you why I eat the way I eat and why I'm actually here tonight. Because when I was 19 years old, this is in 1978, I was a sophomore in college, I was diagnosed as having an incurable disease. I was told that I had Crohn's disease. You guys have heard of Crohn's disease? Yeah. Yeah. It's not a lot of fun. It causes diarrhea and cramps and it can cause even worse stuff than that. And um, so if I, if I don't eat any fried foods and I don't eat any sugar and I don't eat any of this stuff, I am perfectly 100% fine. But if I eat one meal with vegetable oils, I will get sick within a couple hours. So it's not that I'm a fanatic. It's just that I'm doing this for my own good. I, I choose to be healthy every day. And you have a choice as well. And I hope you take advantage of the information you're getting tonight to make these choices. Because if you came into my office on the first visit, I would tell you, I'd go through what you eat. I'd say, well, don't eat this, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't eat this, and eat this instead. I'm going to tell you what to eat instead. That's, the, that's the, what we're going to finish with. But that's the beginning point. Now, you don't have to do this 100%. But if you don't do it 75, 85%, you're, you're going to poison yourself mm -hmm. and have symptoms. And you can take all the supplements in the world. They're not going to help you if you're poisoning yourself too much. So another thing that is poisonous is overcooked foods. If you overcook your foods, you actually create toxins right there in your frying pan or your microwave oven or whatever it is. Microwaving food is horrible. It destroys the food. It changes the molecular structure of the food. Warming it is less bad. Yeah, it's not good. Like it's less bad. Soy is a poison, a metabolic poison. It inhibits thyroid function. It alters sex, sex hormone balance. Inhibits the absorption of vital nutrients. But isn't soy really good? Well, what, what do they tell you about soy that makes it good? It's low in saturated fat, and it's high in protein. And it's got phytoestrogens. All true statements, but that does that make it good for you? Soy used to be a waste product of the agricultural industry. It was only used to reclaim the soil. It brings nitrogen into the soil. It's, a, it's called a rotation crop. And they had tons, hundreds of millions of tons of this garbage, literal garbage, laying around. And it was very expensive to get rid of. So some genius in the marketing department decided, ooh, let's just tell people it's good for them. Let's tell people, let's tell them in the Orient that's what they eat. They don't eat soy. It's like we don't eat ketchup, right? Do you eat ketchup? You may put it on your burger. And by the way, in, in the Orient, they will ferment the soy to make it less bad for them because they knew fermenting it actually detoxifies it somewhat. So we were sold this bill of goods. And now people out there eating soy burgers and soy chicken and soy hot dogs and soy this and soy that. It's really, really bad. Don't eat this stuff. It is a poison. Other metabolic poisons, coloring, artificial preservatives, insecticides, pesticides, fortified foods. If you have foods that are adding vitamins in there, not good for you. That means they took them all out in the first place. Why do they do this? Why do they make white bread and white rice and white flour and white this and white that? Any idea? Looks pretty. Even bigger reason. It doesn't go bad. Yeah, it does not rot on the shelf. So the shelf life gets extended and they have less turnover of their products and they increase their profit margins. This is the, the major reason for all this white flour. They take out all the vitamins, all the minerals, Anything of value in there, all the fiber, so it doesn't rot. What is this and, white uh, uh, 
about a white bread that has a wheat made out of wheat. I just saw it in the show. There's right. all white, white bread. bread's made out of wheat. This whole thing, oh, get wheat bread. It's better than white bread. It is white bread. Now, it's, now, they put, now they're making whole wheat, and they're trying to push this thing. Oh, whole wheat's good. Eat as much as you want. This is nonsense. Too much bread, whether it's whole wheat, gluten-free, organic, blah, 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 blah. Too much of it is no good. But the thing is, when, what they do is they take all the vitamins and minerals out and, and, and fiber, and they put it on the shelf. It lasts forever. And then they stick these crappy synthetic vitamins in to replace them. And you know what they are? I'll, I'll, let me just go back here. Here they are right here. This crap that they're putting in, the breakfast cereals, this pyridoxine hydrochloride, riboflavin, thiamine hydrochloride. But it's not, this is not really B6. It's pyridoxine hydrochloride. This is a chemical that is the same as B6, but it's not active B6. It's synthetic B6. This is not the active B6. The active B6 would be pyridoxine 5 prime phosphate. Now, the really scary part is that so every food you're eating has these synthetic vitamins in it, or a lot of them, and you're getting more and more and more of these synthetic vitamins. And guess what happens? The more you eat, the less nutrition you have. That's why I'm saying that fortified foods are actually not good for you. Try to find them, though. It's, much, it's very difficult to actually eat healthy. You have to really do your homework. What is BHT? This is a, a BHT is a um, preservative. Now, the really scary thing, if you go to GNC or whatever, you go to the vitamin shop, you go to the supermarket, and you buy a multivitamin, guess what kind of vitamins you're getting most of the time? Same, thing you get Same garbage water. you're getting in the white bread and the, and, the, and the crappy cereals, but in higher dosages. Take your B50s. They're great for you. You get 50 milligrams of this, 50 milligrams of that, 50 milligrams of this. You're getting ripped off by a lot of these supplement companies. Now, they're not all doing this, but most of them are because most people don't know the difference between pyridoxine hydrochloride and pyridoxine 5 prime phosphate and some of these other higher quality nutrients. So. Where are we now? All right, soy products, other metabolic poisons. Should I use nutritional supplements? Only use nutritional supplements if you really know what you're doing, and most people don't. Avoid megadosing. This is very dangerous. Don't try to treat symptoms with supplements. Very dangerous as well. Be alert to miracle health claims. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. If you want to use supplements to help balance your body chemistry, do it under the care of someone who actually understands what they're doing, a doctor that can actually monitor your response to supplements, can monitor your acid-base balance, your oxidation, reductive balance, your autonomic balance, your mineral balance, your hormone balance. So what should I eat, Doc? I'm finally going to get to the punchline. I just have one question. What yes, about sir. eggs? What about eggs? Um, well, let's talk about eggs. This is a perfect example. We've heard that eggs are good, right? Yeah. We've heard that eggs are bad. Right. right. Yeah. Can they be both? No. Yeah. No. no. They're either good or they're bad. So the people, someone's telling you a lie and someone's telling you the truth. How do you, who, do you know, who do you trust? Who do you know which one is, is which? Why are eggs bad, sir? Cholesterol. They can t is cholesterol really bad for us? I haven't gone into the whole dispelling that myth tonight, and I did a whole talk on this last week on, on cholesterol, okay, but cholesterol is not bad for you. This is a myth. This is made up by the food companies to sell vegetable oil. So the whole premise of eggs being bad is based on a lie. Eggs are not bad. Now, if you fry the eggs, especially in vegetable oil, they are poisonous. I would never recommend that you eat them that way. But if you take an egg that's whole gra or, uh, free range from a free range chicken on a healthy diet, and take that egg and poach it or boil it. It is absolutely one of the most nutritious things you could possibly put in your body. But how are you going to know that that's the kind of egg you're getting? Well, you got to look. You got to buy it that way. It says whole, whole, uh, free range, organic. Mm -hmm. Now, half the eggs out there are there. Just recently, though, that haven't been on the shelf like that a long time. Well, it used, they used to all be free range and organic. Yeah. Now they're feeding them. They're in these egg factories, basically. And we had that recent egg scare. Yeah. Right? This is from the egg factories. This was not from a real farm. These are commercial farms. And they're sticking omega-3s in the eggs. Oh, omega-3 eggs. Don't buy these things. You want the real eggs. If I see omega-3, I'm like, get this out of my sight. I don't want to see this anymore. They're putting omega-3s in, 
in milk, eggs, bacon, everything. You can't find, it's almost impossible to find something without omega-3s. It's amazing. Um, turkey, yes. What about milk? It's going down to the statue and they say whole milk is the What kind of milk are you talking about? Are you talking about raw? Raw, unpasteurized, unhomogenized milk, it's illegal in New Jersey. It's very good for you. <laughs> Raw, homo unhomogenized, unpasteurized milk is very good for you. Yeah, but if it's been pasteurized and homogenized, it's not good for you. I don't care if it's organic. I don't care if it's lactate-free or fat-free. It's not good, and I don't have to spend a whole talk on this. Soy milk is terrible. There's, you know. I'll tell you what I drink. I drink goat's milk because it's not homogenized. It's much less processed than the cow milk. What does it taste like? It tastes like regular milk. It doesn't taste goaty. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to introduce something called the cruise control diet. It's got a balanced proportion of carbohydrates, protein, and fat. It helps maintain your blood sugar levels, helps maintain healthy lipid levels, helps maintain healthy weight, and here it is. You want to eat three meals every day. And every meal should include a serving, it doesn't have to be a large serving, about the size of the palm of your hand, you've heard this before, of meat, fish, poultry, eggs, or cheese, preferably something that's more natural. Preferably something that's not containing growth hormone and antibiotics and other hormones and raised on soy. Think about the food chain. How do they fatten up the cows? Corn-fed beef. If you feed the beef other things like butter and coconut oil, it'll actually be skinny. They tried this on the livestock, feeding them coconut oil. The, the livestock got really skinny. They feed them soy. They feed them corn. Why? Because they want them to be fat. If you want humans to be fat, feed them corn and soy. Yes? There's actually, um, I, I have Netflix, there's actually a movie up there called Food Inc. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard of it. I don't want to watch it. I'm scared. I don't want to watch it. Same thing. Do you want to include pork also? Food? Yes. Preferably less um, processed. Eat plenty of low starch vegetables. You can eat as many of these things as you want. You're not going to get fat. Preferably organic. Keep the pesticides and insecticides down. Limit your intake of sugar, including fruit, for reasons I mentioned before. And we're not going to get into the fruit argument again, lady in red. <laughs> Avoid juice and other sweetened drinks. There's no good reason to drink juice. Oh, but isn't it high in vitamin C and blah, 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 and I do juicing every day and very, very full of fructose. Spring water should be your main drink. Avoid consuming vegetable oils. These are found in salad dressings, mayonnaise, margarine, and foods cooked in these oils. Extraordinarily poisonous. Stay away from fried foods. Avoid mega dosing supplements. Avoid overcooked microwave and overprocessed denatured foods. Only use nutritional supplements, only use nutritional math supplements, and consult with a medical doctor if you want to be healthy who understands physiology, bio, body chemistry, and not just treating symptoms and diseases. This is a way to be healthy. You're never going to get healthy taking drugs to treat your symptoms. If your cholesterol is high, that's not necessarily a good thing. If you come into my office and your cholesterol is 300, my reaction is, oh my god, it's high, I better give you a drug. My thought is, what's causing this cholesterol to be high? Is the patient consuming too many prooxidants? Are they eating too many fried foods? Are they eating too many sugars? Do they have a thyroid dysfunction? There's all these reasons why your cholesterol goes high in the first place. Treat the cause of the problem. Unfortunately, you go to most doctors, your cholesterol is high. The first thing that happens is they take out the prescription pad and they hand you a prescription for a drug to lower your cholesterol. If cholesterol is an antioxidant, which it is, and one of the most important antioxidants in your body, which it is, and it's high, your body is being burnt up. And the cholesterol is there to put out the fire. If you lower your cholesterol at that point, guess what happens? The fire gets worse. Think about some of the side effects of these cholesterol-lowering drugs. Burning in your muscles, aching in the muscles, weakness, problems thinking straight, all these things. And they're not minimal amounts. They're very, very common. And by the way, I'm not giving any medical advice tonight, ladies and gentlemen. Please, before you do anything with your diet or with your medicines, consult your doctor. We have this on film, right, sir? OK. <laughs> so um, before you go any further, what number do you suggest on cholesterol? 
What do I suggest or what does the literature suggest? That's a better question. When I first started my medical training in 1982, that was 28 years ago, the normal cholesterol was considered up to 240 was considered normal. And then they, the experts, lowered it to 220. Then later on, they lowered it to 200. Now they are saying, just keep going lower and lower and lower. We want your LDL, the bad cholesterol, to be under 100. If you look at the cholesterol tests and the range they give you, go ahead and check it out. Go look at your blood test. It'll say LDL, 0 to 99. It's a poison. Less is better. What, you, what do you think would happen if your LDL cholesterol was zero? You'd die. We would not be having this conversation. <laughs> You'd be so dead, it's ridiculous. In fact, I don't think he would survive an LDL of 30. And if he got down to 50, you'd probably be really, really sick. Yet, this is what the range that they're telling you is desirable. Where did they get these numbers from? You know where they got them from? They made them up. They made them up. They did, a, they did studies to say, listen, you know, if we lower the cholesterol less than 180, we'll sell 20 million more prescriptions. They actually did this. There's no reason for lowering your cholesterol lower than it, than it should be. 200 is pretty normal. If it's 210 or 220, I wouldn't worry about it. If you came to me and your cholesterol was 250 or 300, like, all right, well, let's see what's causing this. But I wouldn't put you on a drug. Probably if there's 1,000 people out there that are on cholesterol drugs, there's maybe one that needs that drug. One out of a thousand. And these people have a cholesterol of five or six hundred. That will actually start to clog your arteries without even oxidizing, just because it's so thick and gooey. But most people don't. And this is a, this is a myth. And in fact, if you're over 65, this is a fact. I don't have this, the stats with me. The higher cholesterol, the longer you live. The lower your cholesterol, the shorter your lifespan over age 65. Now why is that? Because by age 65 you've accumulated so much oxidative stress, so much free radical damage that if you don't have that cholesterol there to put out the fire, you start to wither away. And if your cholesterol starts dropping very quickly when you're older, you are in big trouble. And yet, they're out there telling you you're 70 years old or 75 or 80, oh, take this medicine, you need it. And I'm not saying doctors are bad people, because they're not. I'm a doctor. I work with doctors. I work in the emergency department. We've been misled. We've been brainwashed by the drug companies. We have become pawns of the pharmaceutical industry. And our purpose is basically ends up being pushing drugs. And most doctors have so little understanding of biochemistry or physiology, it's really scary. I had a patient recently. She went to her doctor. And she asked her doctor, should she take CoQ10 as a cardiologist? And the cardiologist's response was, oh, I don't know. I've never heard of that before. Oh, gosh. You laugh. It's scary. Now, either he was pulling her leg, or he, which is not very good, or he was ignorant. Probably one or both. But either way, it doesn't matter. Did you know that CoQ10, we've all heard of CoQ10, right? Yeah. yeah. That's because there's no doctors in here. What happens if you take a statin drug? Anybody knows? What happens to your CoQ10? Your CoQ10 goes down. It blocks the synthesis of CoQ10. Did you know that if you lived in Canada and you bought a statin drug, right on the bottle it says, warning, do not take this drug unless you're taking CoQ10? Yeah, in Canada. Did you know that back in the 80s when Merck came out with the first statin drug. They actually patented a combination CoQ10 statin drug. They patented it. It's still sitting on a shelf somewhere, that patent. They never exercised their patent rights. Why? Because they did not want to open, I assume now, this is my opinion, they probably didn't want to open Pandora's box. So they decided to ignore the science behind it. And if you want to piss off a cardiologist, just mention the words CoQ10. Because immediately you'll see smoke coming out of their ears. Their face, oh, I'm tired of hearing about that. Just like I'm tired of hearing about fruit. They're tired of hearing about <laughs> CoQ10. They've had so many arguments about CoQ10. It doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. 
It's in every cell of your body. Without CoQ10, you would die. And then you take these statin drugs and your CoQ10 levels just go down because you, you, don't, you don't make it when you take these drugs. Well, you make less and less. So let me just recap what I've said tonight. Nutrition's really powerful, way more powerful than you could possibly imagine. And if you're suffering from symptoms, whether it's high blood pressure or diabetes or obesity or aches or pains or fatigue or problems with your stomach or problems with headaches or watery eyes or runny nose, or whatever it may be, there's probably a nutritional component to your symptoms. I'm not saying it's causing all your symptoms, but it's certainly probably something in there that's making it worse. It's so powerful it can actually change the shape of your face from one generation to another and your entire body. What other changes have we been exhibiting over the generations? Well, your eyesight probably gets lots of things. I drink it's wine so that gets stuffed up. Here in What's Duncan. that? I drink a little bit of wine. Yeah. My nose gets stuffed up. So wow. Well, that's good. I can't breathe through my nose then. <laughs> I get stuffed up. Mouth. You know, that's a really good point. <laughs> Listen to your body. Yeah. If you eat food, with air quotes, if you eat stuff, and you get a symptom after eating stuff, Stop probably eating. means that it's not good for you. Right. Yeah, so listen to your body, don't ignore it. Now there are people that they're so sick all the time and they eat such bad stuff all the time that they don't even notice how bad it is. It's only when you actually go on a, on a very pristine diet and then you start to introduce these things one at a time, you go, oh my God, I can't believe I ate this and this happened. When I had so-called Crohn's disease, I didn't realize that eating vegetable oil was making me sick. I was, just, I was living in a dorm at college, and probably everything I was eating had vegetable oil in it. How did you manage, though, with finishing college with uh, your Crohn's disease? Was How did I manage? I, I realized very early on in, in the situation that when I was nervous, that everything got worse. And so I actually tried to talk to my doctors about this. I said, Doc, um, you don't understand. There's something going on. When I'm anxious, it makes my Crohn's disease worse. You know what the doctor said to me? He said, listen, you have an incurable disease. You're going to need to be on drugs your whole life. You'll need to be, you may need to have surgery. You're at high risk of cancer, blah, blah, blah. Get used to it. And I tried to talk to many, many doctors about this. And every time I spoke to them, they stopped and started talking about how I felt they stopped listening to me. I could tell they stopped listening. They would roll their eyes, there's a little smirk would go across their face, and they'd tell me, get used to it, kid. You have this incurable disease. And so I, I took the medications for a while, for about a year, and I, I noticed that, you know what? These things aren't really helping me. When I'm nervous, it gets worse. When I'm not nervous, it's better. So I decided, you know what? I'm going to learn how to control my nerves. So I started getting into weightlifting and running and meditation and martial arts and all this mind-body stuff. And lo and behold, I got a lot better, way better than the drugs. And then I thought to myself, what's wrong with this picture? How come me, as a non-medical professional, knowing absolutely nothing about medicine, knows more than the doctors? They won't even listen to me. They think I'm a, I'm a joke. And so I made a decision. I said to myself, you know what? I'm going to go to medical school. I want to find out what's going on here. And you know what I found out when I got to medical school? That you don't learn anything. <laughs> you learn how to treat and identify diseases. Oh, if the patient has diarrhea and blah, 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 then he has Crohn's disease. If he has this symptom and that symptom and this symptom and that symptom and the pathology slide shows this, he has that disease. And I kept asking, but what causes those? Well, nobody knows. It runs in their family. These are the answers I got. Or why do we do this? Oh, because the book said so. That was the answers I got. Why does the book say so? Oh, because a group of experts came together and that's what they decided. Is this kindergarten? Right? The teacher said so. That's why we're doing it. That's the answer I got in medical school. I almost got thrown out a few times. <laughs> Many times. And I said, you know what? I'm not even going to bother trying to learn half this nonsense because I'm going to end up brainwashed like the rest of these people sitting next to me. One of the other things that we learned in medical school is how brilliant we are. Oh, you're so brilliant. You're the, I remember the first day of school. You're the best of the best. You're the cream of the crop. You're the, you are the, the top of the top. You're the smartest and the brightest and the most brilliant. And everything that you need to learn is going to be within these four walls. They really said this to us. And my colleagues, were, they're, they're, they're just soaking this in. Oh, yeah, I'm so smart. I'm so this. I'm, and I'm sitting there going, you've got to be kidding me. You're learning a bunch of retarded stuff and you think you're smart? 
So anyway, I decided, you know what, I'm not even going to bother learning half this stuff. I'm just going to try to get through. I'm not going to memorize a bunch of minutia. Why would I want to learn this stuff? It does, it's meaningless. And I got through medical school. I graduated. And then I actually trained in internal medicine, got my board certification in internal medicine. And when I finished training that, I said, you know what, I don't believe in this stuff. I don't believe high blood pressure is a disease that's going to be cured by a drug or this or that or the other thing. And so I decided to do emergency medicine. Let me tell you, medicine has its place. It's a wonderful thing. Western medicine, if you're hit by a truck, you want a surgeon. And you want to be in this country with that surgeon. And if you, you, know, if you need surgery, you want to be right here in the good old USA. And if you have pneumonia, you want to be in a hospital getting antibiotics. And if you're bleeding, you want stitches. Okay, that's what I do in the emergency department. I don't do surgery, but I fix you know, cuts and broken bones and put people on antibiotics and call the specialists if they need it. That's where medicine belongs, and it's great. But what about for chronic degenerative diseases? What does it have to offer for arthritis or asthma? Well, asthma is a different story. You can actually treat symptoms of that, and you need to. But, but for chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia or heart disease, it offers very little, honestly. And, and maybe some of the treatments are actually worse than nothing. And a lot of these things are being caused by our diets, ladies and gentlemen. Our diets are so bad. And if you do exactly what they tell you to do, you're in huge trouble. Eat low fat, eat high carb, make sure you use low, uh, you know, artificial sweeteners, they tell the diabetics, right? They do. They do. They yeah. Some of these artificial sweeteners actually cause blindness, the and they're telling you to eat them. Yeah, of course, there's dysentery, too. Some of the other doctors that are out there to write books, um, I don't know, are some of them good? Like, I heard of a doctor, or I read a book, Ray D. Strand. Is he good? What is, what's the book? Uh, about nutritional medicine. It's called what? No, it's uh, uh, what you don't know about nutritional medicine. What your doctor doesn't know about nutritional medicine because well, could, could kill you. Yeah, it could kill you. <laughs> probably a lot. It's true. Yeah, there's a lot. What they know. What when you hear something about nutrition from the mainstream, do ex I know this sounds really cynical. Do exactly the opposite of what they tell you to do, and you're probably in good shape. I know that sounds really cynical, but if they say eat low fat. Don't do it. If they eat, say, eat high carbs, artificial sweeteners, these things are really poisonous. Doctor? Yes, sir. How about diet soda? What about it? What's the question? How bad? It's really, really bad, and you should drink it. I thought this ought to be mentioned tonight. Of course, is soda it? is really very bad, and artificial diet sweeteners. Artificial yeah. sweeteners are really poisonous. They will rot your brain. They cause chronic degenerative diseases. So artificial sweeteners, fried foods, vegetable oils, excessive sugars cause, they cause chronic degenerative diseases. And if you consume these things on a regular basis, you will develop a chronic degenerative disease. And if you want to age gracefully and with less pain and less disease and less impairment, you will take these things out of your diet Nutrition is extraordinarily powerful. And the foods that you're eating are making you sick, and you're consuming these things every day. Stop doing this to yourself. Do yourself a favor. Do your, and not only that, do your kids a favor, and your grandchildren a favor, and your great-grandchildren, because what you're eating actually. What happened? A bug. A bug. <laughs> Little fight or flight response over there, huh, Ed? I thought he got burned. I didn't thought somebody fell over. Don't squash it. Ay, ay, ay. Even the yogurt has aspartame, is no good. Aspartame is bad. Hey, um, any questions before we finish up? Yes. It's fine. Fine. I didn't have any vegetable oils at that Chinese restaurant. I did have the vertigo, but at least I didn't have any problems with my stomach. Thank you for Yes, ma'am. What about stevia? What is stevia? Stevia, natural stevia is actually very good. It's, some people don't like the taste. They have this new thing out called Truvia, which is not stevia. It's something synthetic stevia. I'd stay away from Truvia. Stevia is good sweetener. The only problem is the sweet taste itself is actually addictive. So yeah, it's, it's the best of the sweeteners in general. But um, it's still sweet, and it's still will, you'll still be addicted to sweetness with that stuff. Yes, sir? You told us everything that 
I just told you before. Were you listening? You have it right here. Prescription for healthy aging. You have these two slides. Excuse me. What about salt substitutes? Like what? Um, you know, like a salt substitute instead of salt. What kind of salt substitute are you talking about? Salt's not necessarily bad for you. You know, if you have low blood pressure. I tell my patients that have low blood pressure, eat lots of salt because it will raise your blood pressure. Too much salt is no good. Too much salt is no good. What about Splenda? Splenda is, Splenda is poisonous. Oh, really? That's why I also let you guys know that. Let me just do a quick thing here. I'm, my office is in East Brunswick. You have my contact information. What's that? Saffron oil? Not that familiar with that. You're talking about safflower oil? Okay, I'm, I don't know much about saffron oil. It's a very light oil. It's probably very um, polyunsaturated. I, I, if it's not coconut oil or butter or olive oil, I wouldn't recommend it. In the back? You were talking about oh, too much water. What's, what's too much water? That's different for everybody. But you shouldn't be drinking, you know, gallons and gallons a day. You'll know. You'll be peeing like every five or ten minutes. It's, it's hard to overdose on water unless you're trying and, and hazing or for a fraternity. That's a good amount. Yes? I would like to thank you for bringing up uh, about statins. My cardiologist has me on a statin. I am having problems with my memory. I'm remembering things that I have a pretty good brain. And I find now that my husband can verify it. Words. Are you taking CoQ10? No. Go out, do yourself a favor, and get some CoQ10 immediately and start taking it. Um, and talk to your doctor about the statins. And, and you know, what is your cholesterol like? Uh, it was 146, and in three months it came down 100 points, so it's going to 146. Oh, it was 246, now it's 146. And can I assume you're over 65? So. If you were my patient, I would not treat you for that high cholesterol at all. I would say, listen, 246, you're, you're over 65. Statistics show that the higher your cholesterol, once you're over 65, the longer you live. When you speak of that, you're speaking of the bad or the good cholesterol. I'm talking about the total cholesterol. Total cholesterol. Yeah. There's no such thing as bad or good. This is made up. Yeah, this is another myth. Yes. I just want to mention, I was on equal a sweetener. Yes. And I was losing my memory. And I'm very, very good with memory. I went off of it, and everything was fine. I just want to mention. Equal that. is also known as aspartame. It is extremely poisonous, and they're changing the name, folks. They're changing it to amino sweet. Why are they changing the name? Because people are starting to realize aspartame is poisonous. So they're changing the name to make you not know. I, I think high fructose corn syrup, they're changing the name of that too. I forget what they're calling it. Did anybody hear what they're calling it? These big companies, they, do, they, they don't care. They just want to make a profit. It's really, really not um, that good. What's that? Splenda. That's Splenda. That's um, sucralose. That's instead of having hydrogen in your with your carbons, carbohydrates, they put chlorine instead, and it actually bleaches your cells. Eventually, not good for you. No, actually, amongst the artificial sweeteners, saccharin is the least bad. Really? The one they tell you don't use? Yeah. yeah. Whatever they tell you to do, do exactly the opposite, and you're probably in good shape. It's amazing. Keep that rule in mind. All right, two more questions, and then we're going to say good night. <coughs> yes? Uh, can you, how about using honey and whatever you would use sugar in your drink? Honey's like, sugar. It's fructose. It's sugar. very, very high in, in fructose. It's not good for you. There you go, Dorothy. No, honey? No diabetic. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> what do I do where? At my, at my, at my clinic? Yes. I fix metabolic imbalances. You come in, I ask you what you're eating, I check your body chemistry for acid-base imbalances, for autonomic nervous system imbalances, for hormonal imbalances. Take blood work? I do blood tests, I do other things. I try to figure out what's causing your symptoms. In fact, on your first visit, I will tell you, I'm not going to treat any of your symptoms. I'm going to try to fix what's causing your symptoms. And it's a very, very powerful method. It's not medicine, though. It's actually diet. 
the, the, the practice of medicine is what's covered by insurance. That's treating symptoms and treating diseases. Since I don't do that, if I actually took insurance for what I do, it would be considered fraud. So I don't take insurance. It would be considered fraud. I don't want to go to jail. Yeah. But it's not ridiculously expensive either. Do you have a book coming out? Yes, I do. And the name of the book is The Power of Nutrition, How the Foods You're Eating Are Making You Sick. You've actually heard a lot of my book, yeah, tonight. It's too long? That's good enough. That's good enough. All right, listen, thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. Hope to see if anybody who has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. I've got to get ready on my